I am Choya Wilson Daniel, and this is the Earn and Invest podcast. Perfect. I was a skinny little kid, all bones and no muscles. Every year in school, we did the annual fitness exam in our gym class. My nemesis was the pull up bar. I couldn't do a single one, no matter how hard I tried year after year. I ate extra portions, did push-ups to build strength, and my outsides began to change. I grew and got bigger, but I still struggled with the pull-ups. No matter how muscular and tall I became, success only occurred when my insides changed as much as my outsides. I had to start believing in myself as the kind of guy who could do pull-ups, and then one day, I could. Many years later, I would face a similar struggle with business building and my finances. Often reality changed faster than my mindset, and I found that it was actually me. I was the one standing in the way of what I truly wanted. Has the same happened to you? Choya Wilson-Daniel founded Love Shift Coaching in 2018 to support women who long to run their own businesses on their own terms so that they can make a powerful difference in the world. A licensed clinical therapist by trade and author of Rich on Purpose, an inspired woman's guide to money, life, and self-love, Choyo travels around the country speaking to women and girls about nurturing a healthy money mindset. Choyo, welcome to Earn and Invest. First and foremost, as I was reading about you, I have to ask this question, how did you end up in foreclosure? Hi, Doc, and thank you so much for inviting me on your show. I was making six figures, high earning six figures, and I just did not have any financial literacy. Growing up, all I was taught was to go to college, get a nice paying job, and when you get paid, just pay 10% of that to the church for your tithes. That's all I got. So I lived off of 90% of my income recklessly. I didn't have anything to do with it, even though I knew I had bills to pay that just wasn't in my programming. So I ended up on the foreclosure list and it had nothing to do with the money. (laughs) Let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, most people think the reason they get into financial problems is that they don't have enough money. You were making six figures. It was more than enough. It was definitely more than enough. I just did not know what to do with the money. I was living in Atlanta, trying to keep up with the Joneses, always at the Louis Vuitton store, at the car lots, just really, it was a self-image issue for me. And just trying to look like I had it together on the outside and not really taking care of what I needed to take care of. You thought you could buy your way into being who you wanted to be. Yes. And I and it ended up backfiring on me. <laughs> and I learned some hard lessons because of it. You mentioned this idea that this is kind of what you grew up knowing how to do. Tell me a little about your financial models. How were your parents with money? So I lived in the average middle class household. Both of my parents were entrepreneurs, but I grew up listening and being around that struggle energy. So there was always a lack, lack of either time, lack of resources, lack of energy, living paycheck to paycheck, waiting on my father to get the big contract. So when he got the contract, we lived good for a month or two, and then it was feast and famine. So it's no surprise looking back that I live my life the exact same way that my parents did. So that was my model, live paycheck to paycheck, no real conversations about investing. It was just always go get a good job. They didn't even encourage entrepreneurship. It was just get a good job with a nice pension and have some security. So they were both entrepreneurs, but it sounds like there was this environment of scarcity, like you better spend it while you have it because it may not be here. It was the message that I received growing up, not intentionally, was there's never enough. You're always going to run out. So you're at this place where you grew up with this idea that there's never going to be enough. 
you're making six figures, yet you end up in foreclosure. What was that rock bottom? And if so, what does that look like? And what does it feel like? It was definitely rock bottom for me. I panicked. I, of course, went to the extreme. I thought I was going to be homeless. And I had to figure it out real quick. And for me, figuring it out was not getting more money. It was what's really going on in the inside of me. What's causing this to happen? And I had to really, really go to the root of those results. And that was hard because I didn't want to look at myself. I wanted to blame the government, the president, not making (laughs) more money. I wanted to blame everybody but myself. I did not want to look inside to see what was going on. Now, a lot of people get to that point. And instead of looking inside themselves, they keep on blaming. Was there an aha moment for you? Was there something that turned the tide where you said, okay, now I have to take personal responsibility? Yes, it was my image. It would have been too shameful for me to foreclose on a home. And I, I had to put the brakes on everything. And luckily I ran into uh, my mentor now and my mentor just really, really helped me to do the work. And I was surprised that the work didn't include working more hours. I'm like, you're not going to tell me to go get another job. (laughs) I want to spend some time talking about what that work actually was. But before we do, where was your spouse at this point? Were you married? And was he on the same page as you? I was not married. I was fresh out of undergrad, made the most money in my my life. Making the money was easy. I was getting uh, extra hours, extra gigs. I've always been a hustler. So no, it was just me living my best life in Atlanta, Georgia. (laughs) So you told, you said that your mentor started helping you realize what steps you needed to take. And none of those steps necessarily had to do with working harder or more. Tell me some of the things, at least in the beginning, he taught you that really had an impact. Initially, it was just introducing me to the concept of paradigms and that we have paradigms. And in particular, in this case, I had a money paradigm. So I had to really, really uncover and discover what my money story was, what my money beliefs were. And that alone, that awareness alone was an eye opener for me. What were some of the steps that helped you realize? So obviously you grew up in this place. There was feast or famine. There was waiting for your dad to get the big job. So you'd have money for a little while. Obviously this has a profound effect on a child, but most of us aren't as aware exactly of what those money stories are and how they're harming us. What were some of the steps you took in the beginning to just realize what those harmful stories were? I had to stop and look at, the results that I was getting in my life, I had to realize that every month, no matter how much money I made, I ran out of money before the month ran out. So it was really just looking at my results and I kind of reverse engineered my results. What, what does that mean exactly? What do you mean reverse engineered your results? So I couldn't figure out what the story was, what the programming was. But when I start identifying my results, I start noticing a pattern. And when I noticed the pattern, then I was able to put connect the dots. You've said before in the past that money is the most important relationship or one of the most important relationships we have. What does that mean exactly? So money, we need money to survive. And I believe wholeheartedly that we were all put on this earth with a purpose. And I believe to operate at your highest level of self, you're going to need that tool of money to operate at your highest version of yourself. And a lot of times we don't realize that we need to have a healthy relationship with the money and we avoid it. I treat money just like I treat my spouse, my mother, my dogs, (laughs) and anyone else. I have a conversation with my money. I have date nights with my money. I really attend and appreciate my money. And then it sticks with me now. Before, I was this toxic partner. I was treating money money like a sugar daddy. Mm -hmm. And so it was no surprise that it stayed away from me. I didn't appreciate it. I didn't value it. I never said thank you. 
for what it has provided for me and my family. I wasn't grateful for it. And, and if you're in a relationship with someone that's not grateful, that never appreciates you, that's always resentful, at some point you're going to leave that relationship. And that's what money did to me. <laughs> so relationships take work, right? It's not easy to be in a relationship. I've seen you say before, it takes a lot of work to be broke. Tell me about that a little bit, because it sounds like what you're describing, being healthy with money also sounds like it's a good deal of work too. Yeah. So there's always work involved, but I had to choose my heart and I've been broke before and I've been abundant before. And I like feeling abundant way more than I do like feeling broke. So I don't mind working and sacrificing with the outcome that's going to produce the results that I want. Being broke is hard. You're working all the time. The anxiety, the shame, the guilt that you experience because you're always trying to figure out how to get more. So you're in this get mindset. And with that energy alone, it's draining. I was having headaches. My health started to decline. It was a lot living in a broke mindset. You talked about the guilt and the shame. Do you think that's primarily an issue around money? Or do you think when people are feeling that, it's about some deeper worries and concerns and they kind of play it out with the relationship with money? I think it's both. I know there's a lot of shame attached to debt, which creates more of debt because for whatever reason, we're listening to that shame voice and we refuse to let it go. And so that keeps us in that same cycle. So we're talking about dealing with some of those paradigms about money. And you've related this idea of dealing with money as like being in a relationship. Do you feel like it's more difficult as a woman dealing with these things as opposed to a man? Because I know a big part of your platform and a lot of your coaching is to women specifically. How is it different? Well, we were trained that as men, men are the face of business. Like if you're a woman, you should stay in your place, stay in the home, be the housewife. So it's really difficult for women to show up in a world that was created for men. And then when women try to start charging what they're worth, that's a whole nother level of judgment and shame. So women continue to underprice and quote unquote, stay in a woman's place. So yes, it's, I think it's extremely difficult to be a woman in business. It's getting easier now because society is accepting it more, but it's still a hard place to be in. When we were discussing your parents, you said my parents were entrepreneurs. And then we talked a lot about your dad's experiences. What were your mom's experiences? Was she a business person too? And, and how was it for her? So my mother is a fourth generational blueberry farmer, and I saw her put her entrepreneurship and dreams aside initially to help support my father's business. She actually went back to work for a while. Um, Then she was able to leave her job and she started her business again, but her, the farm ended up being on a foreclosure list, just like me. She didn't foreclose, just like I didn't foreclose, but her name was on a list. And I saw the struggle with entrepreneurship. And I realize now why it was never encouraged for us to go that route. But I saw my mother struggle more trying to be an entrepreneur than I did with my dad. Compare and contrast kind of your experience with your parents to also coming of age in Atlanta, a place where entrepreneurship in the last decade has been booming. Did you find some better role models within the community, people who maybe had more of an abundance mindset as opposed to scarcity while living in Atlanta? Yes. My first employer, he was an African-American psychiatrist. And I thought that was amazing. He had hospital. He just lived this abundant life. And I'm not just talking about financially. He was abundant in every area. He encouraged entrepreneurship and he was an excellent model for me of what was possible, not only for a woman, but for a black woman. 
You mentioned before that when you hit that kind of aha moment and started working through some of your money issues, you were helped quite a bit by a mentor. Was that the mentor? And if not, how did you go about finding a mentor? Because that's another thing people really struggle with is when they're trying to get things straight, when they've hit that bottom point, they're like, okay, I need to move forward. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they just don't know how to find the right people to help them. Right. So no, he was not my mentor. Now he was my supervisor. So I did get some mentorship from him, but I found my mentor on YouTube and I kept watching him and his message kept resonating with me. And then when I reached out to one of his um, staff members, when I heard the price tag, I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot pay for this. And then, you know, I kind of ignored it for a couple months. And then my spirit just kept leading me back to him. And I told myself, I cannot afford not to pay for his program. I pulled money out of my 401k and that was the last time I ever had to borrow money again. Wow. So you knew, because that, that's a big step to pull money out of your 401k. You knew that it was time to actually invest in yourself. I had to do something different. Nothing else was working up, up until that point. And if I knew what to do or how to do it, I wouldn't have been in that position. So I had to find somebody that was steps and steps and steps ahead of me that can really help me clear out all this gunk, gunk that was in the inside of me, this junk the debris, as I call it. (laughs) I'm interested in this idea of how you find a mentor. You chose to invest specifically money in mentorship. There are a lot of people right now who feel like they're on their last dollar. How important is it to pay for help as opposed to try to find someone to volunteer, try to find someone in your community? Is it something that that we should pay for? Yes, for me, when I paid my money. I paid attention. Now, when I wasn't paying and I was doing all these free trainings and free seminars, I wasn't showing up. But once I paid that money, it forced me to pay attention. And I knew that I needed a return on my investment. And the only way I was going to get a return on my investment is if I did everything this man told me to do. And so I showed up just like it was a job every week. Every hour I did the homework, I was authentic and I showed up because my life really depended on it. How important is it for your mentor to look and sound like you? Because, you know, just based on your brand, you're a woman, you're a Christian, you're an entrepreneur. You were just saying that this mentor that you paid for, in this case, happened to be a man. How important is it for them to look and sound like you do? So he doesn't look or sound like me, but he had the results that I wanted. So I was looking at his results. I was looking at his lifestyle and I was looking at his track record. And for you, again, that sounds like another case of reverse engineering, right? So you said, (laughs) what do I want my goal to be and how do I work my way back? And this person seemed to, to really speak to you. What compelled you so much? Was there something specifically about his message that you were drawn to? Yes, he was broke like I was. He was broken like I was. His story just resonated so much with me. And I said to myself, if he can do it, I can do it. He came from a family with no education. His highest level of education was like eighth grade education, was raised in the Great Depression. Poverty was his mindset. And he wasn't born into wealth. He didn't have a silver spoon and he earned everything he's making now. And I said, oh, that's me. That's my story. I can relate to that. I love what you just said, because you said he was broke like I was. And then you said he was broken like I was. And it reminds me of this dichotomy between mindset and tactics, right? So one thing is to teach someone how to make more money specifically. And another is to teach them about how to think differently so they can make more money. Which do you think is more important? How to think differently. Because if the thinking hasn't shifted or changed, then you'll get results, but it'll be temporary. We're looking to get permanent results. And the only way to get permanent results is to change that paradigm and to change that thinking. For you, did that happen quickly? I mean, I've heard people say that their mind kind of changed 
once they got the right message, their mindset changed immediately. Whereas I've heard other people say it took them years to kind of wrap their head around this. How was it for you? So I had to stay in the study. It didn't happen for me overnight. I work every day to this day, working on my mind and my mindset. First, for me, it was the confidence. The confidence shifted first. And then that was like a ripple effect. But I make sure I'm in this material and I'm studying every day. I wish it could have happened for me overnight, but that's not my story. It took 30 years for this program to get in me. (laughs) So it's definitely going to take some time for me to reprogram my mind. And what does that look like today? I mean, do you still feel like you're in the midst of mindset change? Is it still something you're constantly studying? I'm constantly studying. I'm constantly becoming aware. And every day is expanding. And every level, new level I play at, that old paradigm shows back up. But I'm aware of it. And I just kind of dance with it and keep it moving. And tell me something more recently you discovered about yourself, because it does sound like it's a constant evolution. Have you had any interesting epiphanies lately? What kind of things are you even still learning after you've built quite a successful life for yourself? Yes, I'm still learning. And my mentor pushed me every day. Like you're comfortable now. That means you need to grow some more. I thought you get to a certain place and it was done and it was over. And that's not true. So I'm expanding every day and every day I reach a goal, I have to dream bigger and realize it's not over yet. I can't just stop. There's another level to this. So yes, my mentor is definitely throwing me off the ledge and pushing me. (laughs) Is it safe to say that this is meant to feel uncomfortable? It is safe to say it's meant to feel uncomfortable. When I feel uncomfortable, I know I'm growing. When I stop feeling uncomfortable, I'm just stagnated. And I'm not saying uncomfortable in the sense where I'm stressed and anxious every waking minute of the day, but I have to feel uncomfortable or I have gotten too comfortable at the level that I'm at. We're talking with Choyo Wilson-Daniel, who founded Love Shift Coaching in 2018 to support women who long to run their own businesses on their own terms so that they can make a powerful difference in the world. We are going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is Earn and Invest. All around the world, tech companies are innovating and driving returns for investors. Our crowd analyzes companies across the global private market, selecting those with the greatest growth potential, then brings them to you. From personalized medicine to cybersecurity to robotics, quantum computing, and more, in state-of-the-art labs, startup garages, and anywhere in between, our crowd is identifying innovators so you can invest when growth potential is greatest. Early. Our crowd's accredited investors have already invested over $1 billion in growing tech companies and many of their members have benefited from the 46 IPOs or sale exits of their investments. Now, you can truly diversify your portfolio by investing early in innovative private market companies at rcrowd. Join the fastest-growing venture capital investment community at rcrowd.com slash EAI. That's O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D dot com slash E-A-I. Let me reintroduce you to Choya Wilson-Daniel. She is the founder of Love Shift Coaching, as well as the author of Rich on Purpose, an inspired women's guide to money, life, and self-love. Choya, let's talk about this idea of getting healthy with money. We started mentioning it earlier in the show, but I want to go through the steps. One of the first things you talk about are money blocks and how we address them. What are money blocks exactly? Money blocks is really just anything that's preventing you from having the flow of money come in your life like you want it to come. So anything that's preventing you from adding an extra zero to your income, anything that's stopping the flow of money. Give us some examples, either from your own life or from some of your coaching clients. An example of a money block could be not charging your worth, underpricing. And that's yeah. something you said, especially female entrepreneurs commonly do. Yes. Yes. 
that's definitely a common one. The fear of loss. A lot of women believes that believe that if they have the money that they want or if they live in abundance, they're going to lose something they value, whether it's um, relationships with family and feeling like you don't fit in anymore, whether it's the loss of spirituality, the loss of simple tax returns because they know it's going to get more complicated. So the fear of loss is a huge one as well. So let's talk about that specific money block, the not charging enough. Obviously, it's something you probably see on a regular basis. How do people address that? Like, what are the first few steps where they kind of to the point where like, hmm, maybe I don't charge enough. What can they do from there to kind of change that mindset and make smart decisions for their business? So one, we look at that belief that I'm not enough and I'm not worthy of money because that's what it boils down to. And it all all goes back to a self-image, self-esteem issue. And one of the things we start doing is saying, I serve, I deserve. And we start shifting that thinking. We start flipping the switch on that. And it's really an inter-victim. They feel like if I charge more, I'm taken from someone. And it's really not them taking. It's really, really them projecting what they feel onto someone else. I imagine after listening to your story that one of your money blocks was this idea that if money was present, you better spend it while you still had it, something that maybe you grew up with. Yes. And that's exactly how I live my life. As as soon as it comes in, I'm spending. The You know, the old cliche was, it's like you have a hole in your pocket. As soon as you get it, it's going right out to somewhere. You're going to find a reason. And and that goes back to that paradigm. If the paradigm is you're always going to run out, then there's always going to be situations and circumstances to create that. So if money came in, then guess what? I was going to have a flat tire. If money came in, the furnace was going to blow out because I was creating all of this stuff to happen in my life to fulfill that belief. So you mentioned paradigms, which I think is another big step in getting healthy with your money. Help me understand this. I I assume if money blocks are like the action you do, which keeps money from coming your way, paradigms are more the belief system surrounding that money block. Does that make sense? Yes. That I don't deserve money. I don't deserve abundance. I have to work hard. That's a big one. I think like every woman I work with, that's like number one. If I want money, I have to work myself to the bones. (laughs) That's a huge one. You ever get the paradigm that women feel like they should be spending time on their children or families and that there's something wrong with spending time on their businesses? Yes. Family, they don't want to hire a housekeeper to help with laundry or cleaning because they're that's what they're supposed to do. And to be a mother or wife, you're supposed to do all of this stuff. You're overwhelmed, you're tired, so then they don't have time to work on their business. So yes, definitely. Is it as simple as pointing out these paradigms to people or how do you actually get them to start acting differently once you've identified them? Once we identify them, we almost, it's like we leave that model alone. We create a whole new model because it takes a lot of work to try to create a new model. So we build another model until this old model become obsolete, if that makes sense. Yeah, that that does make a lot of sense. And that's quite interesting. So you don't try to necessarily unravel it or even convince them that it's not right. You kind of say, let's put that aside and work on something different. Do the old paradigms eventually fade away if people see success in your new paradigms? They fade away, but they're always there. The difference is now you you are aware of the old paradigm and it doesn't have that control over you. It doesn't have as much power. So now we're just dancing with it. And it's just like a shower. You're going to take a shower every day. We're doing the same thing with these money paradigms. We're cleaning and washing them off every day. But we are aware now and we're not going to give as much attention to it. So it's going to die down. It's not going anywhere. It's going to be there. And every new level, the same old paradigm will show up. It's interesting because 
what that makes me think about is the fact that acceptance is a huge part of this process, accepting that we're all kind of flawed and that we have these funny ideas about money. And you're probably one of the first people that I've ever heard say, you know what, don't try to get rid of that. Let's just kind of accept it and move on to something healthier. Because because I'm lazy by nature. And that's a lot of work. <laughs> that's a lot of work. And I don't want my time spent with these women spent on looking at all the negative stuff, using all our energy, not to blame, but blame comes up. That's a lot of work. Now, another part of getting healthy with money is realizing the difference between your internal and external image. You say something that I love. You say you can't outperform your image. What does that mean exactly? One example is early on, I just felt like I wasn't enough. That was my self-image. I'm not enough. I felt like I had to go outside of me which looked like for me getting multiple degrees. So I just kept getting degrees, kept getting certificates. And after each degree, each certificate, each coaching training, I still felt like I wasn't enough. So I couldn't outperform that with all of this stuff on the outside. It wasn't until, and I could have saved myself tons and tons of money and tons <laughs> of that if I would have done the the job internally first. It's an inside job. It's inside out. I was looking at everything on the outside. I thought another piece of paper would make me feel like I was enough to show up and coach women. I thought that if I got another certificate or some more alphabet to add behind my name, that it was going to make that shift for me. And it wasn't anything on the outside. So you can't outperform that. You have to do the work. You can't run from it. You absolutely have to do the work internally and shift that self-image. And then you have what you want to have. Some of those letters after your name are a licensed therapist. And as I listen to you talk, I realize how much of dealing with your money is really therapy. And maybe people don't always, maybe they want to go and look at the numbers and look at the budget and feel like that can be enough. But it sounds like for you and your style of money coaching, a lot of it is really using your therapy background to uncover some of some of the deeper issues people are facing and how yeah. they relate eventually to money. Yes, definitely. The money trauma. A lot of women have so much money trauma, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Money wounds from childhood. Yes. And do you see them dragging their husbands into your coaching sessions so that you can explain to them what's going on? Yes, a lot of women do. But I always say, let's work on you first. And when he see the change in you, then we can bring them on. That's a whole nother beast within itself. Men, the thought process with men is, is different. And not just men, but spouses in general, do you find that your coaching clients, as they're going through these changes, do they get some pushback from their family, friends, and spouses about the changes that are taking place in them? Yes, a lot of pushback. And especially because working with me, you have to invest money. And so a lot of men don't want want their wives spending money on investing in programs or on their mind. So it creates some tension initially. And then they want to see a quick return on investment. And this process is priceless because it's the internal stuff. You may not get a six-figure contract doing this work, but you will have peace. You will have the confidence you in all of that. Are there some basic, simple ways that you are able to help get spouses on board? So I do have, when I do an onboarding, I kind of bring the spouses on if they want to. Now, here's the interesting part. A lot of the women don't even share with their husband (laughs) this investment Mm -hmm. for that reason. They know it's time to make a change, but they know their spouses are not going to support them. So in the beginning, they're doing it without their spouse being aware of it. That's got to be difficult, I imagine, because ultimately, you know, we want to have these open, honest relationships with our spouses about money. I think it's part of having a good relationship. On the other hand, I I can't imagine what it feels like to feel like 
unsupported, especially when you finally have the emotional wherewithal to really make some of these big changes? I bet it's something your clients really struggle with. Yes, they definitely struggle with. And one of the main issues is when they show back up in a relationship with a healthy money mindset, they're charging more. It kind of makes the the husbands feel like, well, what's my role now? So it's very intimidating when a woman becomes independent financially. I also imagine that when when people in general, whether women or men, start taking charge of their life, it can be somewhat off-putting to the people who love them only because it's different and it's a change. And those people then have to reassess what the relationship is with the person who's changing. So I imagine it's always difficult for both parties. Yes. So as we're talking about getting a healthy money mindset, one of the last points you make is this idea of purpose and how it relates to our money mindset. How do we define purpose? Because I feel like that's a really important part of why people have to get healthy with their money. Well, purpose, I believe, I believe we we all were put here to create and serve and we get to decide how that looks. If you don't have money, you're going to be operate operating at a low level of your purpose. There's no way that I can be a light in this world if I'm worried about paying my light bill. So you need the money to help you operate your gifts. I like that. There's no way I can be a light in this world if I'm having trouble paying my light bill. Why do you think money conversations have so much fear involved with them? I mean, it's something we're really scared to talk about. We don't like to talk about this in public. Well, for me, we didn't have money money conversations growing up. And then when I became an adult, it was, you don't tell anybody about your salary. Everything was a secret around money. And one of my goals is just to normalize this conversation with money, but it has always been a hush hush zone and no one talks about it. Do you think we'd be better if we talked about it more frequently, not just with our close loved ones, but with people in general, with fellow employees or friends or family members? Yes, I definitely think we need to normalize it like we normalize everything else. We can talk about every other area of our lives. If we can start talking about money, like we talk about our kids, <laughs> I think um, <laughs> this would be a better world. I was about to say, you don't got to stop people from talking about their kids. They're really good about doing that. So, right. Sometimes even when you don't want them to. but Right. Because they love their kids. Mm-hmm. So if we start shifting a paradigm to loving money and appreciating money, we will talk about that as well. So when I think back to your story, I see this huge self-image shift. And I imagine with your coaching clients, they go through something similar. What happens to the relationships? I mean, at some point, do people start making new friends because their old friends are part of an old paradigm that doesn't necessarily fit what they've become or what you became when all when you went through all this? Some people do, and I and I definitely encourage people to be around, have a circle of people that's going to pull them up and not cage them in. Some relationships definitely switch. Now, they're not leaving their old relationships or friends, but they are creating new relationships that's in alignment with this new mindset. And that's one of the fears. That's why a lot of people don't do this work is because they don't want to leave those relationships because they don't fit in anymore. One of the things is relationship with other people. The other is our relationship with spending your own personal story. Obviously you've gone quite on a journey about how and what you spend on. How do you know when splurging is okay? Like, isn't part of the fun of having money is you can go out and sometimes buy expensive things How do we know when it's all right to to splurge a little bit? So with two things with me, I have shifted my mindset from a consumer to an owner. So now when I buy stuff, when I consume stuff, I normally have some level of ownership in it. So it doesn't bother me as much now because I know if I'm buying an Apple phone, 
that transaction is profitable for me because I have share in Apple. So when I spend now, I'm spending because I'm an owner and I don't mind spending now. Now, if I don't own what I'm purchasing or what I'm consuming, I buy what I want because I deserve it. And I tell anybody, if you want to buy it, earn it and go buy it. But the difference now for me, I was just spending before with no purpose. Now, when I spend, spend it from an ownership thought process, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it reminds me of this idea of spending to be something you are not which I think is something that you probably did a lot of before you kind of changed your mindset to spending for pleasure and enjoyment, which is a whole different thing. Your own pleasure and enjoyment, not necessarily other people's. Right. When you speak of being an owner, whether it be stock or in businesses, you know, we, we've talked a lot about entrepreneurship and I think that's a huge part of your platform. Is that essential to getting your money mindset, right? Because there are a lot of people who don't want to own businesses, right? How important is being an entrepreneur in this whole program that you're talking about? So I think it's very important and they don't have to own a business. They're just owning like the way they think, because the reality is, and what I believe is, if you're not an owner, your financial future is not secure. So we try to shift them to think ownership. It doesn't have to be a business. It can be multiple ways, but just to start thinking like an owner, if you want to be secure in your future financially. So I use stocks all the time. Let's not just think like a wage earner. Let's think like a owner and just buy, I said all the time, one share at a time, just buy one share at a time. And that for me, that was the the shift in my mindset that I needed. So thinking about someone like me, a physician who's maybe an employee in a practice, you have set wages, but maybe being an owner is putting money into that 401k and maxing it out every year. Is that kind of the thought process you're talking about? Yes. Just some security in your future. Yes. So you've come a long way, obviously, from being in foreclosure. Tell me about your current money mindset struggles. What do you struggle with even today after all these years of working on it? So for me, it's not a struggle with money. It may be another struggle like visibility. I believe that money is abundant and there's no lack. That's my new paradigm right right there. So it's not a money struggle for me, but there's other struggle like visibility and speaking and going on stages and that type stuff. That's my struggle that can limit the abundance from coming in. It sounds like a lot of your concerns have moved away from the concept of cash and much more to purpose, right? So what, what is my purpose and how do I fulfill that? What's going to keep me from getting to my purpose? Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's fair to say. So obviously people can go buy your book, but Clearly, there are many people struggling with a lot of the same issues that you had. Are there some good resources, either online or otherwise, general resources people can start with? Because I often find that when people get to that mindset shift, it's often the first step that they have the most trouble with. There's a lot of books out there. I love You Too Squared. I love Thinking Grow Rich. I study that book every day. So I would start with those two books. You two squared and think and grow rich. Yes. I wanted to thank you, Troya, for coming on the podcast today. Often what we struggle with is not just the money, but the money mindset and getting to that point where you're ready to change and then realizing what the first steps should be are very difficult. And clearly both in your book and in your coaching career, that's exactly what you do. You help people get to that point where they can make real significant change. I want to end this episode the way I end every episode by asking you what is up next in your life. And if people want to know more, where can they find you? So first and foremost, what's up next in your life? What is going on with you and your platform? So right now we are actually in the middle of a launch. We're launching a group program for entrepreneurial women of faith. 
who's ready to take it up a notch to get rid of the pain so they can make it rain in their bank bank account. So I'm launching a group program. I'm in the middle of that launch right now. And you can find me at choyodaniel.com. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Choyo Wilson Daniel. That's a wrap. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to remind you that if you're enjoying the Earn and Invest podcast, there are a few other ways in which you can interact with our community. The first is our Facebook group. This is the place where we discuss all our episodes of personal finance, today's headlines. Just go to earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. Again, that's earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. While you're there, you can also go to earnandinvest.com. That is my website where you can find all of our old episodes, some blog posts, as well as video content. We'd love to see you there. You can join our newsletter. Also, my new website, jordangrummet.com, that's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com, is now live. And there you can go to find out everything about the book launch, which is scheduled for August 2022. My book, Taking Stock, is about the confluence of my knowledge as a personal finance podcaster, as well as end of life as a hospice doctor. I talk about the stories what I've learned from taking care of people as they've near death and what that has taught them about money and happiness. Check us out at any of these places, and I'd love to see you become part of our community. Now back to the show. Tell me what you thought of the interview. Was there anything that we didn't cover that you wish we did? This is, I keep recording because I do a little bit of an after show. So there's also a good chance to talk about things we might not have had the chance to talk about. Was there anything we didn't cover that, that you would have liked to? No, I think you covered it all and I really enjoyed it. I was super, super nervous coming on, but you made it. It, it didn't show. <laughs> a very relaxing atmosphere. Um and my paradigm, because I have visibility issues, all this morning I was trying to figure out how I can back out. <laughs> how I can back out. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you didn't. I'm glad too, and that's what I have to push through all the time. So yeah. I really enjoyed it. You know, it is just like everything else in the sense: the more you do it, the better. Um, One of the things I did like about you when I was looking at your pitch letter was the fact that you hadn't been on a lot of podcasts. So it is true. I know when I get someone who's been on a million podcasts, I'm going to get someone who's really, really polished. Mm. But it's also someone whose story has been told a million times and who frankly can be a little boring. So when I saw you, I'm like, okay, that's someone who hasn't been on a lot of stuff. She has a story to tell. Um, I think it makes for a better interview, actually. Um, even, even if it makes you nervous at this idea of being on the interview, I think that's when we get to some of the more interesting things because most of the people tackling this stuff are not polished, right? They're not the ones who are the pros at everything. Most of these people are just like the rest of us. They're struggling. They're trying to figure it out. So someone who sounds like they do, Mm. but yet is saying this really important stuff, I think goes over really well. Um, one of the things I didn't really ask you about, but I wanted to hear was, so we didn't really talk about the fact that part of your brand is specifically Christian women. Do you feel like people of faith, maybe Christianity or even women of other faith that they have a whole separate slew of issues when it comes to financial empowerment? Um, yes. And I always teach, we only have two sources to go to theology and spirituality, and it's the same for everybody in my, in my opinion or my experience. Yes. And why, why do spiritual people have more trouble sometimes dealing with these issues when it comes to money and money mindset? So the teaching has been, it's been, the teaching has been off, but the teaching has been the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. When I tell you that's like the biggest thing I work on Um, And even when I started becoming more visible because my husband is a pastor, 
it was so much judgment. Oh, she's that prosperity lady in the Bible. It was just like mind blowing, but I welcomed it because I had that same teacher in that same training. Yeah. It's funny, right? Because there are some negative archetypes of people who use Christianity and then appear to be profiting, right? Those multi-million billion dollar pastors who we've all heard about with the big mansions and the cars. But the other side of that is there are a lot of people who feel like there's something innately wrong with being prosperous. Yes. And so, you know, your story is also interesting because the one thing you did mention in the beginning is you might have been making six figures and spending like crazy, but that 10% was being tithed yes. right away. So like, think about that as anyone who can tithe 10% regularly can also save and budget, right? If you, if you have the wherewithal to do that, you can also save 10% or do, you know what I mean? It's clearly the skills are there. Um, but you were able to separate emotionally this tithing, which was a very good, responsible behavior from what you were doing with the other 90% of your money, right? Well, I was, that was ingrained since birth. Yeah. Like you can be getting put out of your house. You can't pay the rent. You can't buy milk, but you better put that 10% in that offering. Yeah. So that was ingrained. The budgeting and all the savings, that wasn't ingrained in me at all. Yeah. Well, it was, yeah, tithing was part of your money paradigm, right? Yes. Um, yeah. And so obviously the the real positive in that is not only was it good because you were giving your money to an important cause, but also on some level, it gave you probably some of the skills that you eventually used to do better things with money, right? Because again, I think if you have it together enough to be able to tithe on a regular basis, you probably can take control of a lot of your other financial issues too. And because I went to a mega church, it came out automatically. So I didn't even have to think about yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is also the one of those personal finance hacks, right? If your money comes out automatically and goes into your 401k, right? You're not even thinking about it anymore. It just happens. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 